can't just blurt passwords out. <laughs> sure we can. Password one, two, three. It's somebody's pa password. It's somebody's one, password. Two, three. Someone, and I, I posted that a while ago. I think it was a Facebook post I had where someone uh, took it a little bit too serious. I'm like, someone's pin code to their credit card is 8645. And someone's like, shit. <laughs> I'm just like... That's probably true. <laughs> probably true. Welcome to episode 220 3D printers. And this is miles. Kilometers, for those of you outside the U.S., we cannot stop that joke it's uh it's tired and old but i'm gonna say it every time i made it an alias yes <laughs> that's all yeah if you if you email email that it comes to me so yeah both miles and kilometers at learnsystems.com both are <laughs> that's how that's how you know you're welcomed as a as yeah. a new staff member but uh hopefully you don't get too many welcome emails on there but we're uh miles is way more passionate about 3d printers than i am uh i kind of think they're neat i like the things 3d printers make so i send things to them and then they make them right i think that's how it works right pretty yeah, much pretty much tom doesn't actually mess with these but tom gets a lot of questions on 3d printers so that is uh why we have miles which 3d printer is that so this one is the lot max shark sc10 um the sc10 shark is a little bit different from their normal sc10 in the sense that it has the double extruder up here so that's how you can tell the difference. And that is that is actually a face hugger. Yeah, so. this is a face hugger that we made. So definitely a thing. We, it's uh, an articulated face hugger, actually. Yeah, it articulates really well. And you 3D print the uh, the actual hole of it. You don't assemble it. That fascinates me, the fact that you can print articulating things. Print in place. That's well, just, Kyle's in the background, if you can hear him. He's, uh, he's throwing technical terms for us in place um what is this those are just some building toys that steve likes to use to build things for yeah. the most part this has all been pushed. they're technically children's building toys but so so they're perfect for other my staff members such as steve <laughs> uh yes building toys oh and then we have the dog here yeah uh, what's this stuff called this is actually we'll set it here so i can switch it to the other camera that is a uh that little Oh, yeah, I can't get over a lot of detail out of it. There we go. I think we'll focus. <laughs> focus. Hey, hey, there we go. Anyways, um, that has a neat, unique texture. This is what is a 3D print element called for this stuff? So everything that we've printed so far has been PLA, which is a biodegradable organic sort of thermofilament. So it heats up, gets to be a liquid, and then it extrudes out into whatever shape you want to make it, and it cools pretty quickly. Um, it's one of the more popular types of filament PLA because it is biodegradable and it's easy to work with. Um, it also doesn't have a smell to it as opposed to like ABS or PETG, which are other popular filaments. This one's goes in the dark. Yes. They also make all sorts of kinds of PLA. So this one is the magic stone, uh, from Hatchbox. So it's got like a kind of a grain to it, a wood grain almost, uh, but it's supposed to look like stone and then they make glow-in-the-dark ones. One of the pieces on here is thermochromic, so it changes color depending on heat. All sorts of fun stuff you can do with them. Um, did you have another one that changes color based on UV exposure? Yeah, I actually had one that changes color in the sunlight. It's not supposed to change with black lights either, which is pretty neat. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of cool. Oh, a couple quick housekeeping things. One, there's a link to our uh, kit store. So for all the different filament types and actually the 3D printers we're going to talk about, there is a link so if you were interested in those. Um, also, it is a really loud lightning storm outside. And if for some reason that cuts the studio power, we don't have a generator for the building, uh, that will be the end of the live show, folks. So if it randomly just disappears, I'll tweet something about lightning or something. I don't know. <laughs> Like David said, they've got they've definitely got a substantial learning curve to them, especially a lot of the entry level ones. We got sent a printer that I, I just found really interesting and I wanted to try it out. But man, has it been a whole lot of learning, especially with some of the the early consumer ones because they don't have a lot of the bells and whistles that make it easier. Yeah, so we actually started out, and I have a video we did talking about the um, Ender Three. So is Ender Three is that the model? Yeah, there is at least one video on my channel for that one. Uh, this is the shark one that you said. Yeah. And what's the one behind me? So we also have the Lavist ET4, which if anybody has a 3D printer, it might look remarkably similar to the Anet ET4. It's just a reskin of it. Yeah. We, we, we're going to do a dedicated video, but we said, you know what? 
this seems like a good topic for the live show here. So bring me your questions so we can make an in-depth video next week on these different printers um, and hopefully answer some questions, help you make some choices. And we'll even talk about uh, a little bit. We have set up, oh, I should probably plug my cord in. Slide that giant HDMI down there over here. Is that so you guys can see what's going on here? Um, we have the OctoPrint set up, and that's if you're not familiar with the OctoPrint, he set it up. It's really cool. It's a Raspberry Pi. Um, my computer think for a second. There we go. It's a uh, Raspberry Pi to talk to the printer and control it, send the print jobs, manage the print jobs. Um, on their own, 3D printers aren't very smart. No. They just get commands to, that tell it push out a little filament, move to this spot, push out a little filament, move to this spot. So the, the Octoprint handles some of the file information so you can store things in there. Um, it also handles if you want to inject codes in the middle of printing something, you can pause it, restart it, that sort of thing. Um, pretty you, handy for just overall home use. If too. I click on one of these, will it open? Yeah, it won't start printing it until you okay. hit the print button. So do you, what do I have to click on? Oh, it's loaded. Oh, okay. I don't know if it showed. Does it show it in here? Yeah. So Octoprint's pretty fun. It's got a um, it's got a, a portion of it dedicated to a webcam stream, so you can actually hook up a, a camera to the Raspberry Pi and use it to monitor your prints remotely while they're going. Um, yeah. It also has a visualizer for the G code, so you can see of that. where it's supposed to be moving. But yeah. It's just a it's just a little here. Pretty much just running on a Raspberry Pi here, a Pi yeah. three actually in this case. Yeah. Um, really simple. My home one is a Pi four and a honestly haven't seen much of a performance change it's so simple because when you're sending the g code to it to tell it like you said just move a plate around and drop something it's happening in such low speed yeah. you don't really need anything fast to make that happen and we should hook a camera up to it because we have a handful of cameras we're not using we went on a box from a previous project <laughs> uh what else do we have here can you print a necky sg1100 rack mount yes yeah we are we um, should probably print a handful of those things and set up a uh, Thingiverse. Yeah, Thingiverse we, is I think awesome. we actually have a Thingiverse account. We'll just have to see about getting it populated, get yeah. some stuff in there. Yeah, we'll put some things we like in there because I had the, uh, he printed, and this was in a couple of videos, the Raspberry Pi case, which was actually really slick. Um, I like that thing a lot because it was a rack mount for the Raspberry Pi that I don't know where it is at the moment. Uh, it's gotten shuffled somewhere else. There's a lot of things wandering around. There's, the, we make it look really clean here, but it, the wider we make the camera, the more things you realize are on uh -huh. the table. <laughs> we just like, we crop the frame and like, hey, look how neat and clean this place is. Don't it's, move the camera. Yeah. Don't believe the camera. So the, uh, but yeah, we'll make a, uh, we will get to this. Maybe we'll, yeah, by next week, we'll take a few of the popular things. Uh, the face hugger is obviously pretty cool, but we've had a couple things that we've had branded to, because we stuck our logo on it and stuff like that. And maybe someone wants to print that. We'll just give you the print files for it. So it's fun to, to, to put a whole lot of designs together for things that we can actually use in the office. There's plenty of rack mounted print designs. There's stuff for just legs for your various Unify equipment, things like that. Um, uh, someone said printing stuff that'll fit the full width of a rack. Mostly the solution to that, because obviously the big printers are expensive. Once you get to something that's big enough to singly print that. More but, than a couple grand. Yeah, they jump up in price. But the solution, and a lot of places do this, uh, matter of fact, I can't remember his name, but he says some of the TrueNAS uh, build videos for the budget TrueNAS build. We were talking about the 3D printing case. It There's a lot of slices that are designed for these smaller form, fat, uh, smaller form factor printers that allow you to assemble it all afterwards. So this gives you the advantage of you don't have to go buy the several thousand dollar printer. You can buy a less expensive one and then modularly put them all together and then they click together to fully form. Instead of a single piece, it's multi-piece. Not as sturdy, but good enough for probably what you want to mount on there. Plus, that way, if, if one of the pieces messes up, you can just reprint that piece. You don't have to reprint the entire part that you're making. <laughs> so this is my favorite question so far, and this is a good project. I like this idea. Can we print a smaller uh, TP-Link uh, enclosure? <laughs> Let me grab For the thing. AP? Yes. Almost certainly. I, I can't imagine that that thing is all the way filled up. It's not. I have that in the, in the video. So... If you didn't watch my TP-Link video, this giant pizza-looking thing here, the plate here, see, one, it's mostly empty space. This back 
inner ring is actually the size of the board inside. I don't know what the rest of it's for. <laughs> just, just so it, it looks like a vacuum on your ceiling, mostly. Yeah, so it looks like you suck a Roomba to your ceiling, I guess. I don't know. Eh, probably catch no. quite a bit of the rain out there. Yeah. So, uh, I don't... They made this thing... This is the one co thing that no one could stop talking about. I, I mean, I definitely alluded to it in a video like this thing's huge but yes uh we could take this apart and print a 3d case is this bigger than a 3d printer oh it's almost as big as a 3d it's printer it's the almost the exact same size as the print pad. wow we actually it'll go <laughs> line that up a little bit yeah that thing's as big as a 3d printer for no reason it is it is not need to be that big it's uh i don't know that's dumb <laughs> yeah so, he would probably have to design something like that. I I love printing, but the CAD portion of things, I don't have a I don't have a background in CAD, so that's a lot tougher. Yeah, Steve, uh, one of my other staff members you've seen on the channel a few times, he does some CAD stuff, so he's uh, more familiar with it. He's taking the time to learn a little bit, so he can he can make a few more of the custom things on there, which is pretty cool. Somebody asked if you can photocopy uh, existing things. Apparently, yes. Um, there are builds where you can three D print. A scanner to then scan things and print them which sounds a little cyclical but it's uh it's pretty cool to be able to do that with just consumer technology these days <laughs> something maybe a project we could talk about doing too yeah kyle said move over he says you have your faces behind the printer <laughs> there now you can actually see miles uh <laughs> here i'll just just kind of hide yeah well, it was before we realized the chat was on the window. We had it all set up, and I'm like, oh, the chat's there. It doesn't work now, because he was sitting inside the printer, and it was cool. But, you know, then I like, oh, yeah, that's right. For the live streams, I turn the chat on, because it makes people happy. <laughs> uh, if they make a bigger model access point that costs down the use. Um, yeah, I don't know if they make one. Yeah, so I've been... I've played with both of these, too. We have... I have an Ender 3 Pro at home, as well, and... They've all come out with pretty pretty equitable prints. There's tuning that you have to do for each one. The Lot Max was pretty much the best off the board. The Ender had a lot of little bits in tuning. The Labis one behind me was mostly just an issue with uh, adhering to the print bed. But the glass bed on that one actually helped it out quite a bit too. Yeah, the... Um... Links are in there. I've seen someone ask about the printer. If you look in the description, and I'm going to drop this in here, we have a link to all the stuff we're talking about and the printers we're talking about. Somebody asked, uh, how do they handle printing holes for ventilation? And we actually did a, a bit of a benchmark here, and you can see that it tests the overhang that it can print. And so as you get closer to like a 90 degree overhang, it struggles a bit more, and you can't see the detail on here, but it does actually, start to get a little... That's this. I can probably hold it up for people. These are cool, and this is, um, come on, come on, focus, focus. Maybe, maybe. So, anyways, it oh. prints each layer in a I basically tried. a 2D <laughs> slice. So each each layer is a is a 2D image, and that's all the printer really knows that's there. So it, as long as the the gradient isn't too big for the hole, it can actually do that just fine because it builds it up layer by layer and slowly gets closer. Yeah, so it's kind of cool, and when we do the more detailed video, we did this, and I think we have another one, right? Yep, we did a similar, actually the exact same benchmark on the Labis, same settings, everything like that, just to kind of compare the two. The Shark did definitely outperform the Labis printer, but this is also a much nicer, more expensive printer with dual extruders and a very fancy print bed. Yeah, you can see on the, the Labis one, there was a bit of stringing there, and the filament's not quite as clean, but for an entry-level printer, it's amazing. I wouldn't say amazing. It's pretty good. Pretty good. It's a lot cheaper for that one, too, so that's... Yes, the Labis printer is less than half the price of the, the Shark over here. Yeah, the, um... What was the, uh, what was the price on the Shark? I'm trying... I'll pull it up, but... The Shark was a just under 500 i think and that comes with dual extruders so you can do dual extruders with a shared hot end so you can do two colors you just can't print two colors at the same time it has to switch between the two your slicing takes care of all of that so it's usually pretty pretty easy um and then that also comes with a laser engraver which we haven't done a ton of testing on to be honest 
Yeah, we tried it a little bit. Currently, as of right this moment, it's on sale for $439 on Amazon Prime for this Oh, yeah, one. there's a coupon on it, too. Yeah, so a coupon on it. So this is one. Um, this unit, just full disclosure, was sent to us for review. Um, so that, that at least will get out of the way. But uh, you can buy it for $439. We've been poking away at it uh, for a little while now to make sure we thoroughly tested it. It's held up really well. We've printed a lot of things with it, not like just the printing. stuff here. Yeah, but <laughs> I we... just like printing things. So we've been trying out all sorts of stuff. Sometimes Miles just takes his stuff home and plays it all weekend. So <laughs> yeah, they uh, it, it's held up. That's that's at least one part of it too, because I think that's a big concern before someone invests five hundred dollars in a printer. Like, so does it last for ten jobs, a hundred jobs? No, the the build quality overall is really good. On honestly, both of the printers, they're both very sturdy aluminum framing. Um, not much wobble to either of them unless you have them on an unstable surface. You know, um, that's an interesting question. Can you print rack studs with I it? saw that come through a couple of times. I actually did want to cover that one. Um, so I was talking about the different filaments earlier. There's PLA, PETG, ABS, a couple of really popular ones. They're all used for different applications, though, and I imagine with one that's built for a little bit more sturdiness, like ABS... You might actually be able to get some pretty decent rack studs out of them. Like Kyle said, with 100% infill, just solid all the way through. Yeah, they might hold up. That'd be kind of interesting. I imagine they're, I mean, they're not made with 3D printer, but because uh, how do they make that? Is plastic mold injection, yeah. I'm assuming how that would be made. Um, but you'd be surprised how many things are 3D printed these days. Yeah, there's a, what did we, we got something. Oh, the, the Tiny Pie. The Tiny Pie and uh, Tiny Pilot. I'll go grab that. But that's kind of cool too. I actually found out, too, that uh, a couple of the pieces on the Labis printer over there are 3D printed. So I went to swap out a couple, and I realized that they were just really nice 3D prints, not a plastic injection mold. Um, that's actually really popular, too. Sometimes people will get a bare bones, just the board and some stepper drivers, and they'll print out their own 3D printer from another existing one. Yeah, um, the Tiny Pilot review is coming soon, but the uh, case on it's 3D printed, but well... 3D really printed. nicely 3D printed. Yeah, they, they had it turned on really fine. So uh, this is a Raspberry Pi KVM, completely open source. You don't have to buy the Tiny Pilot to get the Tiny Pilot software. It's available on our GitHub. I'll be covering all this in detail. And we've been, uh, I left, I don't know where you guys left off yesterday. It didn't work with the bigger KVM, but it worked with no. the tool. We got this working with a KVM. So this is a KVM that we hooked up to another KVM. Uh, and got it working. So that'll be part of the review we do when we get this uh, video out there. A little but, finicky, but... A little finicky, but... It, pretty cool. Pretty cool for people, um, especially home lab people, I think are going to be excited about this. And we'll list all the parts that are needed to get this. But uh, the fact that they 3D printed a really nice case, if you get it from Tiny Pilot, it comes assembled in a 3D printed case. Um, and a well-made one, too. So Raspberry Pi cases are actually really easy to print on here. So Yeah, there's so many designs for Raspberry Pi cases, too. Everybody's got their own idea. How do you test the parts for durability? With a hammer. Yeah. We just break stuff. We just bend it, break it, uh, see what happens, and do more test prints. And I broke a few things. The cool thing about breaking somebody, something that's 3D printed is you just print another one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've... Uh, what did I... I dropped something a couple of times. I dropped this a lot of times. I can't believe this hasn't broke. This feels delicate, but I have really been fidgeting with it for a while. And I have not broke it yet yeah. miles is like yeah not yet yeah like, as you like as whip me it in the eye me. with it or something <laughs> but uh it's re it hasn't gotten looser it doesn't feel like it's going to come apart and uh this has be quickly become one of my favorite little so many fidget toys there yeah, are so everything... many things you can print out for just fidgeting <laughs> <It is. laughs> oh what else do we have somebody asked about copyrights on uh on printers or on print files. Actually, a lot of things on like Thingiverse, if you download them, they have licenses. So Creative Commons license or uh, use without sale licenses, things that define how you can use them. Um, but for the most part, they're pretty open. Yeah. So at least be conscious of that if you're trying to make something that you're going to sell as a product. Oh, cool. Those are... These are kind of neat. Uh, yeah. the... <laughs> Kyle just brought these in. They're the... Prime Towers? So, I was telling you that the, the Lotmax Shark... Somebody asked earlier what printer this is. This is the Lotmax Shark SC, SE10 Shark. And uh, it's got a dual filament extruder. So, it's got dual extruders up here and up here. 
that can have two different colors loaded at the same time, and then down here on the hot end, they go to one single hot end. And the way that it handles that is that when it wants to switch colors, it'll back the old filament out and then print a whole bunch of the new one on one of these prime towers somewhere out of the way of the print and circle through until it gets to the new color and then start printing on the actual print itself. So it's a pretty neat way of handling just having one hot end because heating two hot ends uses a lot of electricity. Um, yeah. tends to make it a little bit less stable. So Yeah, it's kind of a neat idea because what this does is, uh, you know, it's clearing the nozzle uh, of that color before it switches and as it goes back and forth when your 3D print. But it makes these weird cylinders, but they're textured. So they feel good on my fingers. And so now they've become the um, fidget spinner of 2021. Uh, they're just solid tubes, but just filament. Yeah, they're just filament cylinders, but they, um, they're they all over our desk now because we sit around and do this. I mean, what else are you going to do when you're waiting for a server to update? You're going to play with this or you're going to play with the face hugger. I still Some... play with the face hugger the most. Somebody said, do you plan on what orientation you print depending on how the forces will be applied on the printed object? Yes and no. You can uh, change the the orientation to try and uh, adjust that. But to be honest, we don't print a lot of things that have forces applied to them. So I haven't done a lot of that yet. I really yeah. want to. I want to get into some of those functional prints, but um, they are a little bit more complicated. Yeah, because you do have to take that into consideration from an engineering standpoint. Um, a lot of, for my... Um, for, for, was it two weeks ago now when my daughter's uh, my soon to be son-in-law was out there doing bike tricks we've actually printed some of the guards mm. for that so they've held up really well um and it's cheaper to 3d print them uh, than it is for him to go buy them uh, but they're not load bearing as much as they are when he does rail slides and tricks they, they take some force they take yeah. the force and they slide on it so they're just kind of a wear on something so that so that, that's actually worked really well i'm actually surprised how well some of that held up it is important to note though because they do when they print they kind of print like this and there's just just less adhesion this way than there is on this axis so it's it's important to at least consider yeah uh is there a filament that will give you a flexible result yes i don't know really? which one though there's um i know there's that a I couple that are that. more flexible so like pla it's it's not very it, it has a certain flex to it but it's not very flexible um some of the other ones are more rigid than pla some of them are less i think there's one actually i'll have to look it up to be honest um but there is one that gives a very flexible but solid fit um that's used T a lot for uh, like someone says ppu parts. is flexible plastic that's the one okay and petg petg is somewhat flexible yeah tpu is the one i was thinking of you know, I, I wonder what the flexible ones are, because uh, if they would be good for this. I've seen people having phone cases on mm -hmm. there. Um, I've actually quickly grown accustomed to this uh, fabric case. One school came out with this, and I tried it. I was like, yeah. oh, this is... I don't want to go back from a uh, fabric one, but yeah. The, a suede case for a while. Yeah, but, but um, soft plastic might be kind of cool. Yeah, that'd be neat. Ban someone. Yeah. The other thing that's worth noting, too, is that your printer has to be able to handle the different filaments. So filaments print in a certain temperature range on the hot end. So PLA, most PLA is going to be between like 190 and like 215 degrees Celsius. But if your printer only goes up to, say, 300, you can't print any of the filaments that need to be melted at a, a higher temperature. Um, some pr Most printers can handle like two or three different types of filaments that they recommend. Someone said they did print a TPU phone case, so that's cool. Nice. That would be neat, because, I mean, making your own custom phone case does sound kind of cool, so maybe we should order that. That's, uh, actually, David mentioned one that's pretty important, too, is a lot of these filaments are toxic. They're, they're plastics. They're polymers of some sort, so when they do heat up and extrude, they have some sort of toxic fume or nasty smell or something like that. My printer's in my room. The printers that we have here are both in the front office. We don't really want that floating around in the office, so we try and stick with, like, PLA, which is a little bit more just friendly. Has a bit of a sweet smell sometimes when it heats up. Someone says, let's get back to network talk. But we're talking about 3D printers I know. right now. <laughs> printers first. And I don't have a ton of network talk to talk about today. I... I have been very busy and I'm very talked out. I, I did that TP link video and um, several others. So yes, 
<laughs> it's on the network though. We've got the printer. It's, it's it's connected to the network. It is, and we use the OctoPi to talk to it. So there is networking involved. It's a server. The Octo the OctoPi is a server. And we did talk about the TP link and the fact that we want to 3D print a new case for it. So we've related this back. We had questions about building this, uh, building rack parts for it and building cases for it. So yes. <laughs> PLA does smell like corn sometimes. Because it's made from corn, actually. A lot of people yeah. don't know that. I just learned that too so today i learned on my live show this is why i don't answer 3d printer questions like they come up as a matter of fact they've come up um a lot because anytime someone sees something 3d printed there's a bunch of 3d printer questions in the comments or people reaching out to us because i mean we do like them and we did a video i don't even know how many views the video got on there but i know there's at least some interest in these devices um and when it comes to whether you're uh, especially, I probably see especially in the home lab. Yeah. Most of the home lab people I know have brought up the fact that they've had a 3D printer, including when I and this goes a little outside the home lab. My cybersecurity friends, mm -hmm. they seem to have a lot of 3D printers. I don't know the crossover. There's a crossover somewhere there. <laughs> I think it's the ability to create your own gadget. It's yeah. the hacker mentality of doing it that seems to ha have people attracted to it, which is weird because I just I, I mean I like things 3D printed. I just didn't care enough to learn it. Then again, I'm, I'm, I have staff that likes right, it, so I can exactly. just like print this thing. <laughs> I've enabled Tom to not have to learn it. Yeah, I have enablers around me that keep me doing things. Uh, now we can all print 3D corn on a cob. Yes. Yeah, probably. Uh, let's see. I mean to get a 3D printer, but didn't know where to start. This helps a little. Yeah, maybe we'll do a dedicated video called like getting started because we're in some way noobs to this. And yeah, he I just got out. started a couple months ago. Yeah, he started out. He's like, oh, there's a 3D printer. Now he's worked here longer than a few yeah. months, but the 3D printer part was like, this is interesting. Um, I don't know what it was. Something just sucked sucked me right to it. I love it. Mm -hmm. So I started learning everything I could about it and the different printers that we have and stuff like that. Yeah. And Miles has been learning all the network engineering stuff too. Uh learning that through osmosis of working here and all that that's there's no way not to learn it because otherwise i'm just listening to talking all day yeah we cover a lot of that he's been learning true nas and learning all those things that's part of the fun part of when you get to work here and start diving into all those topics uh let's see what else i will say both of these printers are definitely intro 3d printers they're uh i know the the shark is a little bit on the pricier side but they're both definitely beginner printers they're not terribly complicated they have all the features that you need they're actually they both have auto leveling although whether you want to use that is up to you um they both are definitely great for getting started if that's something that you're interested in yeah the um it may, maybe this is well i don't even know if jay knows it so we'd have to have you on the home lab show <laughs> to even cover this because i I think Jay doesn't have a 3D printer either, and he expressed interest in it. And I'm like, yeah. oh, I said, we have them. I said, more in fact, I said, I will uh, let Jay have one of them to borrow to play with stuff. Uh, Jay, though, uh, Jay from Learn Linux TV, when I say Jay, sorry, I know him really well, so I just say Jay. Uh, but Learn Linux TV, we've been doing the Home Lab show. We did not have an episode this week um, due to scheduling conflicts and whatnot. Uh, but with that, the uh, it is popular, and especially Jay's into a lot of the video game stuff, and he likes 3D printing all the characters. Yeah. Uh, if you follow Jay on Twitter at all, uh, at, I think he's at Jay the Linux guy on Twitter. You'll find that he posts a lot of he's his game. He just redid his whole gaming room again, so he Jeez. has all the collectibles. Jay's that person that buys a collectible Switch and then doesn't open it type thing. He's got that he. He has all the different old console systems, all the games organized. So he's been posting uh, pictures and people are like, whoa. I'm like, yeah, he's really into it. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many things you can do with a 3D printer with home labs too. A lot of the Unify equipment that people like to pick up for home labs, it's not server mounted equipment. So there's plenty of enclosures for making a, a little home rack out of Unify equipment and stuff like that. Definitely, definitely usable for that sort of field. I didn't know this either. I learned something else. So apparently, uh, most of this filament being made of corn is a more American thing than the uh, people say it's less so in the EU. Interesting. We're, we're kind of like a corn hub of sorts. <laughs> uh, you can finish this stream on your own. All right. Answer all their questions. <laughs> yeah, if there's any more questions about that, don't ask me about it. Um, I mean, come on. I want to somehow figure out a way to insert corn hub in here. Anyways. <laughs> Kyle, I hate it. <laughs> ah, nonetheless. So getting started, 
but it's, uh, uh, it's definitely what I'm hearing people want to do is have a getting started video with it. Yeah, so. that's definitely something that we could do. It's not, it's not hard to get started, but it does seem confusing. There's a lot of terms and terminology, which I mean, that's something that you encounter with home labbing and stuff like that too. So it's not, it's not hard to learn. It's definitely fun. Trial yeah. and error is still fun. And of the two, um, the Ender is a little bit less than the Shark, but the Shark's definitely a better than the Ender. The Shark performs better than the Ender out of the box. The Ender is really, really popular because it's a lot of bang for its buck. You can get really nice prints out of it if you're willing to do a lot of tuning in the in the front end, you know. But the Shark, I leveled this one, and that's about it. It prints really well out of the box. Um, Kira has a profile set up for it. Kira's the slicing program used to actually build the the g code for the files so it was um definitely worth the extra price i think uh but i i still love my ender too so uh, someone said if you're talking about best paying for the buck the nice thing about the ender you have a bigger time investment in it but a less monetary investment in very it. true and uh, it depends on what your time's worth but putting some time into the ender will get you really nice prints for much less than this one yeah I mean, that's where we started with it. I think that's probably it's it's still a good printer. Um, it just took a lot more to get it set up. I remember a lot of time that Steve spent on that one. Steve knows yeah. uh, 3D printers as well. Um, he actually did the review with me on the last one because of that. Because I'm I'm out of my element here. <laughs> we we have these two printers here, and I bought myself an Ender three, uh, mostly because it was on sale, but also because I I really like the Ender. Um, and it's it's just a, a quality printer so i can recommend that one as well so uh short answer is if you're time rich and cash poor go ender if you're time short but have a few extra dollars if you go shark definitely recommend the shark yeah so they're both you'll get a good result out of them just how how much effort you have to put into that to get that result someone says they have the ender five plus Ooh. uh oh there's a few good channels so uh you say Chris Basement, CNC Kitchen, uh, Makers Muse, and Thomas Salander. Those are all YouTube channels. I'm not vetted these. I'm reading comments um, for other places. There are some good channels out there that have some good information. There's a, you know, actually, that's one of the things I like about YouTube as a, in the big picture of things. There's a ton of amazing makers on there, um, yeah. including, of course, our uh, absolute leader of all of us which is adam savage <laughs> no doubt love his video yeah he's great but there's a huge number of makers out there that you can definitely you know pick up and learn a lot on obviously we're i come at it more from the tech side and mm -hmm. i like the fact that i can 3d print random things that happen to fit in the rack matter of fact i think you printed some uh what are those called the the little punch outs that yep. uh, uh keystones keystones it, we even printed there's little wiring labels we printed there's all kinds of little detail things just little things uh, but those little detail things add up a lot like the labels on the rack we, we printed rack labels and printed um they're well they're cable labels that are on the back yeah, they're easier labels. to swap than the uh than like sticking some tape on there don't get me wrong tape is still a good option don't need to reinvent the wheel but the little labels they're easy to just flip on and off and if you've got the time why not yeah, so I'm. It, I know I'm zoomed way out, but the idea is this clips onto a cable like this, and then you can put a sticker on it, and it's just a way to quickly put a label and have it on there. It may sound trivial, but when you look at the back of the rack, when we're always moving things for demos, uh, having something easily labeled when we have it on there makes it kind of handy. So you can put this on there; it sticks better to the uh, network cable. So when I'm plugging into the back of the device, I know which cable goes to what. That saves me a lot of confusion. I have mixed up which cable goes to what. And then my speed test, I've actually gotten halfway through a video with the wrong speed test because I'm testing the wrong ports. Yeah. Or wrong devices. And then so, I'm just really confused. It's just the little thing sometimes. Yeah. Um, we're about halfway through. What are some of the other 3D printer questions we have? So we don't mind. We'll talk about other stuff, too. If you just want to throw questions out for Miles, too, he's, he's usually the one that has the first line of answering the phones here. Yes. So... <laughs> yeah, so if you have any questions about contacting us, I guess. Can yeah, that's... that's can what, ask me. Miles is the person that answers all the contact questions. We actually have a phone number and people call us, and uh, he's the first one to answer the phone. Oh, prints. Prints, feed, and filament. Uh, filament price, uh, I'll pull it up real quick, but we have that in the link I posted. Um, PLA is pretty cheap. Yeah. It's uh, something like this, which is which is pretty solid is like two or three dollars worth of materials and that's that's at the most 
Yeah. Generally speaking, that's one nice feature is it is uh, really inexpensive to print. I remember we calculated some of these smaller things, like this octopus being, I think, less than a dollar. Yeah. So most most things are less than a dollar, honestly. Let me pull some of these up. Oh, you know, I don't think we mentioned this. Uh, the stuff they ship you. Here's one: 3D printer filament, um, lapis plastic bundle for thirty-five dollars. Yeah. So, yeah, this stuff's pretty cheap. Yeah. So. And those ones are a little bit smaller bundles. So typically your, your filament comes in about a kilogram. Um, it depends on where you get it from, though, obviously. Both Lotmax and Labis sent us filament with the actual printers for review. They were, they were okay. They may have been stored outside for a little, little bit too long or outside of a, a good environment, but they did tend to, to crack and break a yeah. little bit easier than I would like this... So one of them broke off a bit. Um, yeah. So what they ship you is enough to do something. So so you don't have a three D printer with nothing in case it arrived before the filament did. Buy filament when you get the three D printer. What they give you is not really enough to truly test it, and it's kind of it, it's the cheapest stuff they could get uh, to keep the price low. So go buy the goods. Go buy a, another ki uh, yeah. thing of it. So yeah, uh, good good filament will definitely make or break your print. It's a it's a big difference. Yep. And, um, oh, the filament that comes without a spool, so you're not making extra waste. I have heard that's pretty good, too. Yeah. Yeah. You can um, just re-spool it. Pretty important, actually, about both of these printers was noise. Uh, I don't think anybody's asked about it yet, but it can kind of be important for a lot of deployments. Um, not necessarily deployments, use cases. They can be very noisy. Some of them have just really loud fans. Some of them, the stepper motors are noisy. Um, yeah, this you, the noise cancellation is canceling out the noise that's making right now. Um, but it does have a fan and everything. And really, what you hear, um, I have to have them stop the printer, uh, especially when it used to be on the wall adjacent to my office. Because if I I couldn't do phone calls and recording, because you hear woom, 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 it shakes the walls. Because as it moves back and forth, uh, it it resonates really loud. So. And that was that one. That one is a good deal louder than this one. And what most people don't realize is it only depends really on the stepper drivers. So the drivers that actually control the stepper motors, the the much faster drivers can can move the motors at a, a finer increment, and that produces way less noise. So the shark over here, almost silent except for the fans. The labist over there, you pretty much only hear the motor noises, and it's pretty loud. Yeah. So I think it's cool. Uh, some printers still use the three uh, slash two point eight five five, but it's less common. Yeah, yeah. I obviously make sure you're buying the right filament for the right printer. But there's probably both of these printers have a point four millimeter nozzle, and they use the one point seven five millimeter filament. <laughs> I didn't see that in the comments, but apparently it's probably been removed. Oh no, yeah, it's yeah. I, All right. it's probably not. <laughs> no, we're not going there. Anyways. Yeah, I don't know if they make Noctua fans of the right size, but that would be pretty nice, honestly, because that's on this one, that's the only thing making noise is the fans. You know, that might be an interesting if they did the Noctua because you could do... Um, they'd have to be pretty high volume, though. Yeah. I'm not positive they have the same standard pc like connectors, but they might. I mean, it's not like they're reinventing it, but I think right. they pull more from the industrial control side because, like, all this type of stuff in here is heavy industrial control style motors, um... They're not, well, not real heavy, just right, but not PC based, I should say. Yeah, they both do have cooling on them. So a little fan blows over your print to try and cool it down. This one's got a big old bulky fan set up here with actually three fans on either side. Might be a little bit too good at cooling sometimes. So it might be good to turn those fans down. Yeah, that's a whole nother uh, making sure the temperature's right and getting it all to stick right. So oh, yeah, a few people said they might, it may work. We'll have to look at that. Might be a. A fan, but Prussia uses Noctua fans. Interesting. I like Definitely that. pretty cool. Um. Oh, and oh yeah. Three, some people are asking. Fans. Yeah, people are asking about proprietariness. That's actually something interesting about these. Is they're built on pretty common commodity parts. Uh, that's a novel thing. Matter of fact, for the Ender, one of the funny things I thought about it was 
you can go on Thingiverse and print a lot of accessories for it. That's Yeah, that's really popular. You can find all sorts of accessories, especially for the Ender 3, because it is so popular. Um, but there's also all sorts of designs for just cable management for different printers or stuff like that. Um, you can also replace certain parts. The Ender 3, I know, is one of the more modular ones that you can swap out parts on. I replaced the board on mine to have more updated, nicer stepper drivers, and it took care of almost all the sound on the Ender 3. Um, I imagine something similar could be done with like that one back there, which is way lot. In fact, I believe I popped the silent uh, motherboard for that printer in our, our Amazon affiliate links as well. Oh, okay. So they actually have one of those you can change too. That's kind of cool. Yeah, you can swap out a lot of parts on them. Yeah, so they're not too uh, not too proprietary at all. So that's that's a lot. That's uh, they are really cool. We will definitely then do a dedicated video to these where we just kind of break down um, those couple printers on there. I will answer a few network questions. Someone did ask if Unify will ever have the AR system ported over to Android. Doubt. Um, for those of you not familiar with it, because you're like me and have an Android, I've only seen it. I think Chris did a video. They have this cool idea at Unify that it only works on iPhone. You would point the phone at the switch and it would show you like an overlay. Kyle was showing me that. It's it really so cool. It's so cool. It's not the most useful thing, but boy, does it look cool. It looks really cool. Yeah. And sometimes Unify likes to look cool, um, not necessarily be useful. Because if. Yeah they wanted to do something useful they would set up multiple wan ips on their on their firewalls and not develop an entire ar platform you know or not develop a door access system and have actual functioning firewalls that have proper modern vpns with user uh interfaces on it but instead they decided that to do something different <laughs> uh tp link or unify first in wall uh wi-fi ap6 um, so we did the review of it and something I didn't mention, I just, it kind of slipped my mind, but I mean, I listed the specs, uh, and we'll list the links to all the parts. So this is Wi-Fi six. Um, but I don't think the in wall model I have is also the in wall two, two, five is only a hundred meg. So who cares if it's Wi-Fi six, it's too slow uh, of a device. So, um, I, I watched that TP link video. I just posted it uh, today. You can dive more into that. It's a new product line for us. He actually helped set it all up. I mean, it was, it wasn't hard to set up. I mean, you found the interface intuitive yeah. and you're not even a Unify expert, but then you realize it looks just like Unify. It looked remarkably <laughs> similar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, TP link firewall versus a USG firewall that I can answer right away. Yes. You can just, yes. Um, it's a, it's a Unify firewall that also has URL filtering. But it has every other shortcoming. I am I uh, my next destination for all the TP Link gear is my house, with the exception of the firewall. I just can't suffer through it. I need VPN back to my house. Sorry, that right there's the non-starter for me and many other people. So I already know like the, to me the firewall is dead on arrival. Like wow. I don't get it. And I kind of commented like you copied all the shortcomings of your competitor. Why? I mean it's it's fine for people who don't need VPN or don't need any routing or who don't mind the fact that as soon as you create a vlan um or a separate network it has wide open access because somehow implicit allow by default is uh i don't know so yeah i don't really i don't know the uh, the tp link stuff cool you, you you got up to speed real quick you copied the competitor and your chart, I think they're about 20% less. I looked at that. I don't know if you looked yeah. at some of the pricing. It's roughly 20% less, but we don't really know how well it holds up. So that's why I got to take it home and actually use it and see if uh, my wife gets angry watching Netflix or something, or my son complains about his video game not connecting or something. Well, he's hardline, so he probably won't care. Those are the important tests, though. Those are the important tests. I, I don't think I'm going to test the firewall at home for much. Uh, that lack of VPN to get back to my house is just going to annoy me, and I'm going to be like, well, now what? I can't. I'm not going to build, because that's a whole other set of fun, trying to build a site to site from my office to there. And I need it for more than just when I connect from my office. So, yeah. Yeah, the to me, dead on arrival there. So, you, you know, UBNT APs and PF Sense router, yes. I the, the size of this thing alone is kind of a non-starter for deploying this. Because the Unify equivalent is the, um, uh, that one back there. Yeah. That... I believe the same specs. Yeah. 
the Nano, I'm almost positive, has the same specs as this device. And I mean, just one from a size standpoint, two from a flush with the ground standpoint. <laughs> yeah, I got nothing on that. That's Wi Fi 6. I know, they're Wi Fi 6, but they're both dual MIMO, and the Unify does make a Wi Fi 6 one similar in size. Don't, they have one out now. We don't have it, right? I wish we did. Yeah, order one. I think this is still pre order. Yeah, oh, it's still pre order. They're like out of stock for the LRs. You can only get the. Right now, you can only get the Unify 6 lights. I think the eight LRs are still on back order. Okay. Yeah, they're not wide availability yet. Yeah, Unify is a little behind on the, um, the Wi Fi 6. Well, a lot behind. Um, Honestly, though, this is the part that not everybody realizes is this is more of a home users asking for Wi-Fi 6. It is not businesses clamoring for it. Um, businesses care about connectivity and reliability over speed. And uh, if you're not using a, uh, what is those, Sonic Wall, <laughs> it turns out these were good. If you have a Sonic Wall, I'm sorry. First, I'm sorry that you have a Sonic Wall. Two, I'm sorry because it has a hell of a time with Unify. I don't know why, but we've kind of narrowed it down to some Cisco models. I don't have all of them because we've talked, to, we've done some consulting on this. Some Cisco models and a lot of Sonic Wall models do not get along with Unify and DHCP. I don't know why. I don't. I mean, someone said it's in the timing, so I mean, I kind of know why, but I, it's still. It <laughs> seems like it's a problem that is well documented that should be able to be fixed and i don't know why it's not fixed i don't think it's a problem on the sonic wall side um it's just something about the way it handles gcp timeouts uh yes yeah, people calling it a dinner plate yep yeah i mean someone pointed out i could use a pi vpn to get back to my house i could that seems stupid i mean i also could use my uh true nas i have at home and set the vpn up on that but I kind of like the fact that it's configured in my PFSense that just works and works properly and doesn't have any issues and allows me access to all segments of my network with all the policy rules I have. Um, that makes sense. Why can't you build a firewall like that? And of course, the firewall is killer price on the... Um, yeah. I think they're even... the I forgot what the TP-Link firewall was for, how much it was going, but it was really cheap. I was... Uh, pull it up on Amazon real quick. They got it, They got us some price. Yeah, look at that. 59 bucks. With this is the one I reviewed. $59. Right now there's an offer code or a sale code on it, but yeah. I mean, killer price. It's even better than the USG. So I think they've go they they realize they don't have all the features, but for those of you that go, I just need it to route traffic. It does route traffic. I did verify that. <laughs> so in my testing, <laughs> it does it, it worked. <laughs> That's as far as we really went with it in a testing. Um, I didn't buy two of them. You know what I might do is uh, maybe I'll reach out to Chris or uh, I think he's still in here, Cody with uh, Mac Telecom Networks, who's done a few videos on TP-Link Amata. Yeah. Maybe me and him will do a site-to-site -site video uh, with these because he has one and I have one and we'll connect them. And that'll be our collab video is, will these two things connect or will it fail? Uh, TP-Link pizza cooling rack, maybe. A lazy Susan. There are so many dumb ideas we could have for this thing. I might take it apart before the review's over. Not today, though. You have 120 UAP ACEDUs deployed. Should you replace them? Well, I think the question is, do you need to replace them? Is there something wrong with them? I don't know when the end of life is on those because I haven't done many of the EDU models. Um, if they're end of life, then maybe. If they're not end of life and are working fine, ain't broke, don't fix it. And, and it's not just ain't broke, aren't having any problems and ain't broke. We've got people using, and I did all the way till I, uh, only because I changed houses. Like I had when I moved into, um, not long after I moved into the house I had before, I had a 2.4 gigahertz. And everyone's like, why don't you have a five? I'm like, why? Like, I need my phone to connect. That's it. We each of us yeah. have a phone. I hardline all my, uh, the gaming computer, hardline, the laptop, hard, the laptop's not hardline, but the laptop also doesn't care about speed. So 2.4 was perfectly adequate for me to reply to emails with at home. So, okay, they are end of life. If something's end of life, you have a problem because you don't know if there's going to be a, oh my gosh, incident where someone found a big flaw in it. And you're like, oh, they found a flaw. 
Crap, there's not going to be a firmware update. I guess I have to replace them immediately right now under duress. You don't want to replace things under duress. So if they're end of life, um, I highly recommend any any piece of equipment that you know is not getting any more support. It's It becomes a risk factor at that point of you'll a, a flaw may come out and it'll have to be replaced under duress. And that's never the situation you want. Um, we're looking at you, Microsoft Exchange. <laughs> <laughs> I think I broke our demo because I played with all the little fur on it. Oh. Oh, oh well. I couldn't. I, I grabbed it and I'm like, oh, I just pushed all that down. It's only about an hour to print a new one. That's right. We'll just print another one when we do the real video. And we'll say Tom broke that one. Um, Get a fishing line, dangle it around. Yeah. It does look like a UFO. It needs LED lights. Actually, that was one of my jokes because they... They have inside of here one tiny little sub, you know, it, there's not a mark on it where you can see where it is when it comes on. It's got one little blue light and they have an option to turn it off. And I'm like, oh, you think the light, like if I mounted this on my ceiling, my wife would go, can you turn that tiny little faded blue light off? No, that is not what she's saying. She'd be like, what's that? Why is there a Roomba on the ceiling? <laughs> yeah. We are going to wind this down at five o'clock. So in the last nine minutes, uh, any other questions for me, Miles, or 3D printers or any of that fun stuff? We don't have as many people today on the live stream. I think it's because 3D printers uh, brought a slightly different audience because I didn't see any people asking me about uh, OpenSense today. Or Microtech. Or Microtech. Where's the Microtech friends? <laughs> um, will the 605 handle a gigabit internet? A little fuzzy on that. We tested and it seemed to be getting 900, so probably. I think so. I just don't know at what point. Uh, oh, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, so it is currently 4.52 Eastern Time right now. Anyways, um, yeah, I don't know. I, it seems to be able to handle gigabit, but honestly, if you have gigabit internet, you're probably going to be happier with something better. I don't know how it's going to handle when you have a lot of rules or a lot of devices. Um, for example, doing a speed test with iPerf works, but does that mean it can handle 30 devices streaming behind it without getting too hot and going, I'm going to drop some of these? I don't know. Um, that's a much tougher test. I don't have gigabit at home, so yeah. It is 6 a.m. Friday morning in Korea. Um... Do we think they will push away the Cloud Key Gen 2 and instead try to get everyone a UDM Pro? I don't know. They got that stupid advertisement in there. Do you, yeah. you see that? Yeah, That's just I did. dumb. I, I know they're trying to push the UDM Pro, but I don't. it doesn't have the functionality. So they at one point, maybe they'll drop the Cloud Key. I seriously doubt because it would destroy their business overnight if they got rid of the uh, self-hosted controller. The self-hosted yeah. controller is actually the, the key to their business. Um, Unify and, you know, me and Riley have talked about this, uh, Riley from Hostify quite a few times. Unify seems to want to be a consumer company, but they don't realize, um, or just live in a bubble of unawareness, I don't really know, um, the huge number of MSPs and IT providers I know that use Unify as an option because they can self-host a controller, manage a dashboard, and they have a pretty clear product lifecycle and purchase option to make it easy to get. That's where Unify really shines. They can put, they well, they, you know, having a direct sales model because it's 2021 and you don't need to go through some stupid reseller partner program that's confusing and out of stock. Because um, Chris from Crosstock got asked about Cambium and then the, right away people talk about, whoa, by the way, have you tried to purchase Cambium before? They, You've got to deal with different resellers and everything's a pain. It's all awful and painful. Uh, Unify is just like, look, we'll sell it to people. And TP-Link, TP-Link's doing the same thing. They're like, we'll sell you things. As a matter of fact, TP-Link is taking advantage of Amazon and prime shipping. Um, Unify is trying to get everything direct to them because of problems. And maybe TP-Link, uh, it's probably like a growing pain. A lot of people start thinking, you put all your crap on Amazon and you later move it over to somewhere else. And Yeah. Yeah. Uh, dinosaur? Yeah, why not? Print a dinosaur. 1987 here in the UK. Oh, that's time. I was like, <laughs> really? Oh, compact disc. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, trying to, trying to get some of the Netgear stuff. Yep. 
Oh, Miles. Open Sense or PF Sense? PF Sense. Yeah. He's been learning PF Sense, not Open Sense. Do you, he doesn't have a use case for it either. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like my job, so PF Sense? Yeah. We, that's what we do the consulting on. You know what? There's I don't think there's enough demand. Um, none of the Open Sense videos even have a ton of views. I don't. People ask me why I don't do videos on it. And one, I don't use it is the first thing. Two, I, I don't know if there's a demand. And this is some products, even some of the products we use. I look at the Cisco videos. There's not the biggest demand on Cisco. The only demand there is for Cisco is teaching you how to get certified in Cisco so you can check a box at some recruiter's uh, list to get on the job list. I think that's the only thing that anyone has an interest because I asked and not many people seem to even care much for the Cisco videos I did on the Cisco uh, switches. Chris did a video on one of the Cisco firewalls. Same thing. It's not like this highly viewed video where people are going, oh, I want to learn more about it. Everyone's like, eh, it's Cisco. And mostly people want to talk about how to get certified in Cisco, not actually about using it. Or a Vios hype. Yeah, people bring up Vios, but then once they realize it's a command line firewall, they they... Oh, where's the web interface? And someone will point out, there's a web interface. Oh, it's beta. <laughs> Very limited in what it can do. So I I don't know. I don't know if that'll get more developed or not. Uh, Unify is ramping up their shipments. Oh, that's cool. I Unify, they're way behind. I mean, how long? The cameras, someone said there's still one per person, that little tiny uh, camera we got back yeah, there. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's got Steve nodding his head on the other side of the camera. One per person. Ooh, best book to learn networking. Which one did you read recently? He's been diving more into books. Yes, uh, I actually read the uh, CompTIA A plus network certificate, specifically for network, not the A plus certification, but the network plus, I think it is. The textbook written for that. It was really nice to read through. It had a nice tone to it, and I enjoyed it. I got a lot out of it. William, thank you very much for the donation. Much appreciated, and happy Thursday. Yeah, what other books did you read? You did the CompTIA one. Um, the MSP one that you recommended. MSP one. And for those of you looking at the business one, it's uh, Carl's book, MSP book. That one's pretty good. Oh, uh, let's see. TP-Link. Oh. <laughs> Trying to catch up with all the comments. All right, well... It's 4.58. Any last two questions? Or I see someone asking some Cisco questions. I am not a Cisco expert. I used to do Cisco forever ago, and I kind of lost some of it out of my head because I just don't service it much. Steve, one of my staff, services it more. But it's not our it's not our expertise. We're not we're not we fix stuff for Cisco. We help people with occasionally, but it's not it's not what we're known for. Um and we, there's not I don't think there's a lot of demand on it because a lot of times if you're asking for Cisco uh, help, you're usually locked out of it because the previous guy, <laughs> you get rid of the previous IT guy, and then you find out that you need a license for this and a license for that, and you're like, oh. So we, we don't like taking the calls. Frequently, you end up selling them something different. And uh, so hopefully hopefully that helps. I don't know. But if you want to get Cisco certified, I'm not the one to talk to either. None of us, have, none of us actively have uh, Cisco certs. Steve's the only one who went to actual Cisco training classes, and he went through the certification. He just didn't actually get the cert. Didn't sound like he had a good time either. No, he just says, this is stupid. He says that a lot every time he plays with Cisco. As Steve programs things on Cisco, there's usually a stream of profanity in him saying this is stupid a lot. <laughs> Loud enough to be heard from the front of the office, and he's in the back. Um, strange that Cisco doesn't work well with Unify. I, I actually, I don't, I don't, I don't find that uh, to be the case. I've powered uh, Unifies off of Cisco's and we have several clients who've done that. They seem to have no problem with, they really like some of the Cisco switching and using the Unify access points because it doesn't appear that anyone likes the, the Cisco access points. That seems to be a universal, even among my Cisco friends, they're like, yeah, we do not deploy like their hardcore uh, Cisco firewall, Cisco ASA, Cisco switches, but not Cisco um, when it comes to the Wi-Fi, the access points. They're kind of like, no, no, we, we, um, we're not that much of a glutton for punishment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Network Chuck seems to like Cisco. He he did that uh, Cisco stacking video, though, that was wrong. He still never responded to me on that. I, I'm not bitter. I just pointed out it didn't work like Network Chuck's video. I commented on his video, tagged him in the tweet. 
And I said, if you if you know how to make this work like Network Chuck does, let me know. Hey, Network Chuck, can you know how to make this work? I don't know. Doesn't seem to work. That question's still hanging out there on that Cisco video. It's the grab that Cisco over there. Thanks. Those of you who don't know, I can't remember the model number and I can't read it from here. This one? Uh, nope, the, that's the Aruba one. This, <laughs> actually, the Cisco Switch. I have these Arubas, too. I might do another follow-up video on there, but last time I looked at them, they were the same. Um, I should give one of these away. So tag me in Twitter if you think I should give away one of these because they're just kind of sitting here now. Um, but these are the Cisco C1000 switches. We have a couple of these. I got in for demos. I wanted to cover them from a small business standpoint because network trucks video i thought was interesting but they don't actually do the stacking and auto uh provisioning quite the way chuck said um but they're kind of neat so they're they're I, I think they're a quality switch they come with a good warranty and they're a good poe switch i don't think they're bad they do have a web interface on them and i have a whole review of them so if you type in cisco 1000 they're one of the very very few cisco videos i have on my channel so there is not a printer giveaway today, so we don't have that going for us. But I think that's it. Other people are not happy about Cisco. Yeah, I know. The, their licensing fees are usually what makes people unhappy, just like their Meraki's and everything else. And matter of fact, we're moving, we're migrating someone away from Meraki now. We have an engineering company that's yeah. unhappy with their Meraki situation. So, ah, uh, so. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks, all of you. Uh, if you could smash the like button before you wander off, that would be great. And uh, I think that's it. Check out my TP-Link video if you want to know about this. And it does. my TP-Link video does have a picture of what it looks like without the, the, the plate on top of it. And you can see that it's mostly dead air. So for whatever reason, I don't know. All right, man. Thanks, everyone.